other important step that you've taken, which is more from the point of view of insurance companies. And again, we've seen several instances, and that's why it's pertinent that you're bringing out this measure. Something more recent that you've announced is on the advertising. We've always seen this uh, leaning of insurance, some insurance companies, I must say, towards projecting themselves as just another mutual fund or perhaps saying something like NAV guaranteed, giving the impression that it's a stock market guaranteed product. And you have clamped down on that with a whole new set of code of conduct as far as advertising is concerned. Can you run us through a little bit of that? I would say it is not so much that the code of conduct has uh, been brought about recently, no. I would say the rigor with which it's being implemented is uh, slightly more uh, pronounced than it had been in the past. And further, I think the sensibilities of the insurance companies also are more uh, definitely oriented towards better and more accurate communication with, with prospective consumers. You know, in private, when we speak to CEOs of insurance companies, they say these are the best measures that could have actually happened. But publicly, they still seem to be opposed to a lot of these measures. And the industry per se seems to be very, very strongly dictated by the whole distribution slash agent force. Yes, I would um, think that they are apprehensive about the future. These products which we have mandated based upon the new regulations will be new type of products. And actually, if I were a CEO, I would be, I would be worried as to how the public will receive such products how they would be sold, will it, will it affect the bottom lines of the company, and in what way, I would of course be concerned about it. But I would say that there's a fair amount of confidence and a fair amount of uh, optimism in the insurance industry. And I dare say that they will meet this challenge quite adequately. Before we move to the next subject, just to close the mis-selling bit, uh, Mr. Harinarayan, uh, what is the kind of investigative slash penal action that you are intending to put into place. You've put in the rules of the game uh, nicely and properly. Are you looking at putting in place also some kind of a regulatory action regime? Because I haven't seen, and this perhaps seems to be true of mis-selling across all regulators, honestly, that while other aspects are given a lot of importance when it comes to investigation and auditing, mis-selling doesn't seem to really be priority. For instance, I haven't come across a single instance where a mis-selling case has been penalized by any regulator, not just IRDA. But coming specifically to you, have you been able to put in place a mechanism where, for instance, you would have a team of people out there trying to investigate and find out if consumers are being taken for a ride? And if you find evidence, will you take action? Most certainly. And it would be incorrect to state that we have not taken action against mis-selling. We have. Where we have found, for example, certain companies have been selling products which are against what has been cleared under the file and use guidelines, we have fined them. At the present moment, the Act specifies a maximum fine of rupees 5 lakhs for every instance, every such incidence. And we have fined several companies. But apart from what action we are taking, I don't believe that the managements of the company are conniving at mis-selling. I think the managements of the company themselves are quite surprised when such incidents take place. And several of them have removed their agents who have been guilty of such mis-selling and where they could establish it, of course. How many instances, I'm not asking you for specific names, uh, Mr. Arinaran, but how many instances, I, I know the case you are talking about was a recent order that IRDA passed and it's public as far as uh, making changes to the product was concerned, but as far as mis-selling is concerned, sir, uh, some ballpark on how many cases or how many such agents have been hauled up by companies? I would guess that about uh, a few thousand agents must have been terminated as a result of mis-selling across the industry. That's a small number, considering that the industry has three million agents. Hmm. So, while it sounds like a large number, it's an, indeed a very small uh, proportion of the agency force. But that could also be because I think the whole issue of uh, consumers and, you know, feeling comfortable reaching out to the regulator may have just only about now started. Probably, probably. Hmm. So, one of the... Uh, you know, measures, again, I would approach it from a consumer's point of view, which you've taken is as far as, uh, you know, the guaranteed returns on a pension policy is concerned. And that's something that seems to have, uh, you know, got the industry most worried among all the other uh, regulations that you are coming out with. And that's that 4.5% guarantee. And in fact, if I understand correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, most of the insurance companies aren't filing those revised products just yet, still hoping for some change. The, the logic being that uh, that would not be able to let me invest in equity 
uh, as much as I would like to if there is a guarantee. Are you rethinking? Because from a consumer's point of view, to have an absence of such products may not be the best thing, you would agree? No, I'm, there is no rethink on that. You see, an insurance product ultimately has to be an insurance uh, product. It has to have an insurance element in it. There must be some amount of a benefit which is guaranteed. If you take a pension product, or what is sold as a pension product, there are two, there are two phases to a pension product. The first phase is called the accumulation phase where the policyholder pays an agreed sum per year or biannually or whatever is the agreed um, uh, periodicity and he pays it for a predetermined period of time. So after 15 years this money accumulates and that accumulation is known as the vested amount and at the date of vesting that amount is then converted into an annuity. That is it is converted into a monthly or an annual payment Again, either for a fixed time or for life or for whatever other term the company offers. It is not necessary that after the money is accumulated, the same company should be offering the annuity. There's a choice given to a consumer to go and shift the annuity and purchase an annuity from some other company. Typically in India, they do so and they purchase these annuities from the LIC. So when you're working on in an insurance scheme, either you have to guarantee the accumulated phase or you have to guarantee the pension outgo. I will be uncomfortable with the pro proposition that we should have a, a pension product which has no, no inbuilt insurance of any kind, no guarantee of any kind. I think such products are pure accumulation products and uh, there are very many options for consumers who might be interested in such products. Within the insurance space also, if companies are unwilling to give the 4.5% as a pension product, we have products such as ULIP products, standard ULIP products, where a life cover is built in. So those products could be offered. So a range of options exist for the insurance companies and they'll have to make the call. So while you've uh, you know, come out with a new set of guidelines and several such over the last few months as far as ULIPs are concerned, as far as the traditional plans are concerned, the endowment plans are concerned, and more specifically with regard to commissions, uh, are you looking at that at all? Do you feel... Uh, for instance, that commissions, like you've done for ULIPS, where you've made it very clear that you are not happy with the high charges and therefore there should be some rationalization in which you brought it in. Are you going to do the same with traditional plans as well? See, so it's like this. Traditional plans and traditional insurance policies in India have a long history. They go back over 100, 110 years. So I would be very chary about making structural changes in them and I would need to examine it very, very carefully because we have the weight of experience and the knowledge gained by experience for which there is no substitute to before we start uh, re-engineering these products. They have stood the test of time. Our conversation with IRDA Chairman Jay Harinarayan continues on this special Beware episode after this very short break.